Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar, where we'll be focusing on the multiple uses of fluorescent proteins to visualize cancer in vivo. My name is Mike Capps, Marketing Product Manager for UVP, and I'll be serving as your webinar moderator today. UVP is a Southern California-based bioimaging company which manufactures a variety of life science and imaging-based products, and is also the sponsor of today's webinar. Before we start, Let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is familiar with the webinar control panel, which you'll see on the right side of your screen. You can minimize this panel by clicking on the right-facing red arrow near the upper left corner of the panel, or you can expand the panel by clicking the same red arrow. In addition, we encourage you to submit questions using the question pane located near the bottom of the control panel. Simply type your question in the chat box and click the send button. Due to the number of attendees today, we'll be saving questions for our Q&A period at the end of the webinar. For all questions that we aren't able to answer, we'll be glad to reach out to you on an individual basis following the meeting. With that, let's get started. We're pleased to welcome today's main presenter, Dr. Robert Hoffman from San Diego, California-based Anti-Cancer Incorporated, a biotechnology company devoted to the developing tools and protocols to study cancer in vivo. Dr. Hoffman has been a faculty member at the University of California, San Diego since 1979, and in 1984 became the President, CEO, and Chairman of the Board at Anticancer, Inc. Dr. Hoffman is both a pioneer of and committed to the continual development of fluorescence-based in vivo imaging, so we're thrilled to have him with us today. Welcome, Dr. Hoffman, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mike. I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this webinar. It's very exciting. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Our second presenter is Dr. Tony Sanchez, UVP's resident in vivo application specialist. Dr. Sanchez has been working closely with Dr. Hoffman and his team regarding fluorescence-based in vivo imaging and is joining us today to share his expertise on UVP's flagship fluorescence in vivo imaging system, the iBox Explorer 2 Imaging Microscope. Welcome, Dr. Sanchez, and thank you for joining us as well. Thank you, Mike. Great to be here. With that, I'd like to turn over the mic to Dr. Hoffman to begin our presentation. Dr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mike. Well, I'd like to share with everybody uh, some of the technology that we've developed for imaging cells within the animal. This has been made possible by the choice of fluorescent proteins that are now available that can label any kind of cell, including any kind of cancer cell. And it's also been made available by new imaging technologies such as those developed by UVP. I'd like to give you now some background to these new developments. This is an image of a mouse that was taken near the beginning of the development of, of this technology. This mouse had a tumor implanted on its colon that expressed GFP. It subsequently metastasized to many parts of the body, including the liver, which are the big areas of fluorescence you see here, the spine and the skull and other areas of the body. This was back in approximately 1999, and we were very surprised that we could see all these images without opening the animal. We could see them totally non-invasively. We understood at that time the great power of GFP. Here is another early image of cancer cells labeled with GFP in blood vessels of the mouse. This is not a live image, but from a tissue uh, piece on a slide. But it gives prelude to what we were able to do shortly thereafter, to dynamically image cancer cells trafficking in blood vessels and, and in lymphatics in a live mouse with GFP expression. We now come to some more examples of imaging cancer cell trafficking, as I have mentioned. In order to get very uh, information, uh, very informative images of cancer cells tracking, we've labeled them with GFP in the nucleus by linking GFP to histone H2B, and also labeled the cytoplasm with RFP using retroviral uh, our, uh, red fluorescent protein. These cells can inform not only uh, when they are undergoing mitosis or apoptosis, but we can image the deformation of the cytoplasm, the nucleus, and many other aspects of subcellular dynamics in the live mouse. 
Here is an example of cells trafficking single file in a narrow capillary of a live mouse. You see approximately five or six cells over time in a small capillary with diameter of approximately eight, eight microns. The cells traffic slowly, but they are able to move. And during the period that they move, they, some of them, as you can see by the blue arrow, undergo mitosis. So this was one of our first images of cells trafficking, in this case, in a small diameter capillary. These are cancer cells. Subsequently, we wanted to develop uh, models in which we could image in real time cells trafficking in larger vessels, which would give us information how cells travel to distant sites within the animal. In this case, we made a skin flap, and in the skin flap, we injected cells in a particular vein and then imaged their trafficking. Here we see two cancer cells in a uh, medium-sized vessel with a GFP-expressing nucleus and an RFP-expressing cytoplasm. They are crawling on the inner wall of the vessel, and they are approaching a much larger vessel which much, with much more hemodynamic force. And we'll see in a second what's going to happen. The cells can no longer adhere to the inner vessel wall because of the large force of the blood flow in the big, in the big vessel and are now just going with the flow of the blood, probably going to die. Here we say, see cells, cancer cells trafficking in a moderate-sized vessel. I'd like you to look at the rolling cell at the bottom of the screen. It's passing by cells that have been immobilized uh, on the inner vessel wall. And this cell seems to have its own navigation system bypassing all these cells that have been arrested and going on to perhaps do some nasty damage, forming a metastasis at a distant site. This is an embolus of cancer cells stuck on the inner wall of a vessel. And we're going to see it now collide with another embolus that's mobile. The two emboli then adhere to each other with some of the cells escaping. You get some idea of the dynamics of cancer trafficking within blood vessels of a live animal. This is a single cancer cell with a very large nucleus, probably due to excess chromosomes, which most cancer cells have. It has a small cytoplasm uh, labeled with RFB, the nucleus with GFP. You can see this cell very, in a very clever way navigating through a network of blood vessels, a rather complex one, and still managing to uh, go forward. It's not clear how this cell uh, mobilizes itself, how it moves. It seems to be able to use any part of it as its forward, forward face. These are cells uh, in a blood vessel, and they are undergoing the process of extravasation, which means cells leaving the vessel. And uh, it, as you see this starting to happen approximately 72 hours, it, the cancer cells seem to poke a hole through the vessel wall, and the cytoplasm and the nuclei start to come out. And after some cells, one cell comes out, other cells can follow, and they can go anywhere else within the tissues surrounding the vessels and do whatever damage they're going to do. This is a time-lapse image of cancer cells in a vessel about to extravasate. We can see the beginning of the extravasation process in time-lapse here. The cell pokes a, a protrusion of its cytoplasm through the vessel wall. The nucleus then follows the cytoplasm. Soon the whole cell will be out. And what we don't show here is that other cells will follow and leave this vessel, go out into the tissue, and probably form a colony of cells. And that would become a metastasis. Here are cells that have extravasated. And they have found their way to the outer wall of the vessel. And this is a good way for the cells to get nutrients by diffusion as well as gas exchange. And they are able to grow to a large extent on the outer wall of the vessel, perhaps, as you can see, at 48 hours moving out into the tissue. These are other cells which have extravasated. And they stretch along the vessel, outer vessel wall as they would in a Petri plate almost. 
in the outer, in the 120 hour panel on the right, you see some cells rounding up, preparing to undergo mitosis. And the panel on the left, you see the cell actually undergoing mitosis, as many of these cells will on the outer surface of the vessel. This is a very interesting experiment where we contain, where we compared cancer cells in the live mouse between mice that were untreated and mice that were pretreated with cyclophosphamide, which is a, an anti-cancer drug. But in this case, we pretreated the mice before we injected the cancer cells. And we were quite surprised that in the cyclophosphamide pretreated mice, the cancer cells went on to form many colonies, as you see here, whereas in the untreated mice, they couldn't form many colonies. So what this is telling us, this cancer drug, is also killing probably cells involved in innate immunity in the mouse, allowing the subsequently injected cancer cells to grow. So cancer drugs like cyclophosphamide are double-edged. On the one hand, they can kill cancer cells. On the other hand, they can kill immune cells that can kill cancer cells. So we have to be very careful when we treat with chemotherapeutic drugs. Blood vessels are one way for cells, to, cancer cells to traffic from various parts of the body to another part. The lymphatic system is also a widely used system for cancer cells to traffic. We imaged cancer cells expressing GFP, in this case, targeting a lymph node. You see many cells that have already gotten to the lymph node, and we see more cells coming. The lymph node seems to be attractive for cancer cells, perhaps through chemotaxis, and they like very much to target the lymph node and grow there, and perhaps later moving on to other organs. Here we labeled a lymphatic as well as a lymph, a lymph node itself with some FITC dextran. Cancer cells expressing RFP. You can see them trafficking along the lymphatic and then coming all the way into where the lymphatic uh, attaches connects to the lymph to the lymph node and then taking residence taking up residence within the lymph node in this case we have labeled the lymphatic with an antibody a fluorescent antibody called live one which is specific for lymphatics and we can see in this uh, label lymphatic the uh, clumps or emboli of cancer cells going to and fro as we know the the lymphatic system is not pumped by the heart, but, but it is propelled by muscular movement and other body movements. So the cancer cells make some to and fro movements, but eventually they, they traffic through this uh, label lymphatic, and it's labeled in great detail because the live one antibody is very specific. We've tried to make a spontaneous model of lymph uh, node metastasis. In this case, we injected some HT1080 human fibrosarcoma cells expressing red fluorescent protein into the foot pad of a mouse. And we found some very interesting, uh, in, uh, in, 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 interesting trafficking how these cells target the popliteal lymph node near the knee. The darker labeled vessel is a blood vessel. To the left is a lymphatic. These cancer cells seem to only traffic in the lymphatic system on the way to the popliteal lymph node. They don't go into the blood vessel for reasons we don't understand. Here we see a, a rather lonely cancer cell in the lymphatic that has been shed from the primary tumor in the foot pad on its way to the, the popliteal lymph node through the lymphatic channel. Here, we did something that surgeons should not do in the operating room. We put pressure on this tumor on the, fat, on the foot pad, and what happened was that a lot of cancer cells shed, and they're shedding rather specifically only into the lymphatic. So this is not only an interesting imaging experiment, it's a lesson for cancer surgeons, don't squeeze the tumor. Cancer cells don't grow by themselves in the body. They grow in very close interaction with host cells, sometimes called stromal cells, which are 
a very specific population. In order to identify stromal cells distinctly from cancer cells, we made a tricolor model. In this case, we used a transgenic nude mouse expressing green fluorescent protein in most of its cells and tissues as the host. And then we injected cancer cells expressing GFP in the nucleus and RFP in the cytoplasm into this uh, mouse, in this case the foot pad. This is a non-invasive image of the tumor growing in the foot pad. It's a subcellular imaging, but we, subcellular image, but we have not penetrated the skin whatsoever to get this image. And what we see here, the green cells are the stromal cells, various populations, fibroblasts, perhaps macrophages, others. And then we also see the cancer cells, which have a red cytoplasm and green nuclei. And the lesson from this is, not only can you do subcellular imaging non-invasively using fluorescent proteins and appropriate imaging systems, but we see here the cancer cells are in intimate relationship with the stromal cells. Not what you see in the textbook, but this is a real live non-invasive image and perhaps this is what really happens in cancer, that wherever you have cancer cells, you have stromal cells intimately interacting with them. Here we did some optical sectioning of the tumor, starting from the outer part. The outer part of the tumor is green because it's a host green mouse. But as we get a, just a little bit deeper into the tumor, we start to see the dual color cancer cells. And the lesson from this is continuing from the last slide. Wherever you see cancer cells, you see stromal cells intimately interacting with each other. This is a, another non-invasive image of the cancer cells growing in the foot pad of the green fluorescent mouse. The cancer cells are double labeled with GFP in the nucleus, RFP in the cytoplasm. So not only do we, do we see the stromal cells here and the cancer cells, but we see a blood vessel with lots of green lymphocytes trafficking in that. So we see a tumor blood vessel with lymphocytes. We see the stromal cells and we see the cancer cells all intimately interacting with each other in the tumor in real time and non-invasively. We haven't perturbed anything here. We treated this mouse with doxorubicin and we've had a very strong effect. There's almost no cancer cells left. There's perhaps one dying one there. Some of the stromal cells have survived. And what do we see in the tumor blood vessel? All the lymphocytes expressing GFP are gone. All we see are these red fragments of what were formerly cancer cells. Remember the cytoplasm of these cancer cells expressed RFP. Well, they've been degraded. And here we are, we have some cytoplasm from a dead cancer cell in, in the blood vessel. So here we can see the effects of chemotherapy on everything in the tumor, the cancer cells, the stromal cells, and the cells within the tumor blood vessels. Stromal cells are not just happy passengers or happy neighbors. They help these cancer cells metastasize. Perhaps other stromal cells are involved in killing the cancer cells, but there's certainly a population that are essential for cancer cells to metastasize. Here we have a very interesting model using the GFP mouse, which is very bright green in almost all the organs except the liver, which is fortunate in this case for this experiment. And if you inject cancer cells in the spleen, the cancer cells like not only to grow in the spleen, but grow in the liver uh, and form what we call experimental metastases there. And we saw something very interesting. We used red fluorescent protein expressing cancer cells, injecting them into the spleen. And every time we saw metastases in the liver, they were surrounded by the splenocytes. And we later showed that not only are these splenocytes just passengers, they are essential for the metastasis. If, if you deprive these cancer cells of splenocytes by injecting them into the portal vein, they won't form metastasis in the liver. And here we have this experiment exactly here. So um, we, this is a very small table about frequency of liver metastasis. So if these are colon cancer cells labeled with RFP. If we inject them in the portal vein, as I mentioned, no metastases will develop in the liver. And if you inject them in the spleen, 
as you can see on the right, over half of the animals will have liver metastasis. And if we do a mixing experiment, we take the cancer cells and mix them with splenocytes and still inject them in the portal vein, they'll form metastasis in the liver. This tells us the splenocytes are essential for metastasis. Many cells extrude vesicles, now called exosomes. These are very interesting vesicles. They contain a number of biological molecules, uh, some of which are microRNAs, which are very important molecules for regulating cells. And so we wanted to make a, a model of cancer cells expressing GFP in their exosomes. So we labeled an exosome-specific molecule with GFP, and then we uh, label the cancer cells with RFP. And then we looked at how these cancer cells and their extruded exosomes behave when they were growing in the animal. These are breast cancer cells, they're murine, and they form lung metastasis when growing initially on the breast. And here we see them growing in the lung, the red cancer cells, and they've extruded very large numbers of GFP-expressing exosomes. Perhaps these exosomes are preparing the lung for subsequent metastases of other breast cancer cells here. Here is another image of these red fluorescent protein-expressing cancer cells extruding exosomes in the niche where they are forming a metastasis. The exosomes are certainly talking to the lung cells, perhaps paving the way for further metastases. The lung is one of the very most important organs of metastasis where cancer cells arrest and often form colonies which can be which can lead to the demise of the mouse or the patient. So we wanted to have an, a model where we could image this seeding of cancer cells in the lung. So we devised a very intricate system in order to image cancer cells seeding in the lung in, the, in real time. First of all, we developed a, a system for assisted ventilation of the mouse. So we had one lung uh, functioning, and the other lung we uh, tied off so that it didn't move, and we could image cancer cells uh, without interference as they seeded in the lung after we injected them into the, into the tail vein. So imagine now that we've just injected lungs into the tail vein, or, uh, cancer cells into the tail vein, and now we're seeing them seeding on the lung in real time. This is what, how cancer cells seed on the lung. Lots and lots of cells are seeding after, in, in this case, being injected into the tail vein. And what will happen here is that some of these cells will die, but some will remain and form colonies, leading to the demise of the animal. The cancer cells are not only active spreading in the animal, but seem to be able to exchange genes with each other. And we were able to see this type of exchange with the use of fluorescent proteins, especially using multicolors and color-coded imaging. In this case, we had a pair, a pair of cells. These are osteosarcoma or bone cancer cells. And we had one of the pair was high metastatic, uh, and they were labeled with GFP. We had another, the, the other half of the pair were low metastatic, and they were labeled with RFP. Well, when we co-implanted those red and green cells, we found lots of metastasis, and many of them were red. So we were very surprised. How did these red cells, which in, in the beginning were low metastatic, become high metastatic when we co-implanted them with the high metastatic cells. They never did this by themselves. And what we found, as we can see in the next slide, was that the green cells seem to transfer the KRAS gene 
into the red cells. We were very surprised to see this. And so perhaps other genes were transferred as well. But the KRAS, we know, is, is, is one of these oncogenes that could have a big effect on making these cancer cells more metastatic. So we have this phenomenon that we picked up only by uh, color-coded imaging where we understood that high metastatic cells can make co-implanted low metastatic cells into high metastatic cells by transferring genes into them. Another important aspect of understanding how the stroma and cancer cells interact is found by imaging them. Here we have cancer-associated fibroblasts, which are very frequently found in tumors. They're labeled with GFP and red fluorescent protein expressing cancer cells. And we can see how intimate their interaction is. In this case is in vitro, but we get a, a good idea how this how intimate these fibroblasts and cancer cells interact, obviously influencing one another. Bone marrow is very important, not only to form the blood, form blood vessels, but they seem to have an active role in growing tumors, perhaps preparing niches where the cancer cells can grow. Here we have a breast cancer, liver metastasis, the breast cancer cells are labeled with red fluorescent protein. And we, if you look carefully, you can see these little bone marrow cells shooting along there on the periphery of the tumor, obviously giving some signal of where that tumor can grow. Pancreatic cancer is one of the most invasive of all cancers. And we wanted to try to understand by imaging why these pancreatic cancers are so invasive. Here we were able to image the invading front of a pancreatic cancer. And you can see how the cells form these uh, protruding structures that obviously are playing an important role of this invading front moving forward within the tissue. The brain is a site of metastasis. It's also a site of its own cancer. Almost always, either one leads to the demise of the animal or the patient, unfortunately. So we wanted to see the behavior of the brain cancer cells or the brain metastatic cells at the subcellular level, how they divide, how they react to drugs at the subcellular level. In order to do this, we made a small craniotomy window in which we could image through. And by doing so with the proper imaging equipment, as UVP is going to demonstrate to you, we were able to see single cancer cells in the brain at the subcellular level in the live mouse. They're labeled with GFP in the nucleus and RFP in the cytoplasm. As we see them as single cells in A. And in B, they are starting to form a colony. I emphasize again, this is, these are images from the live mouse through this craniotomy window. We also wanted to see what happens to these cells at the subcellular level when we treat them with a drug often used for treatment of brain cancer, in this case, temozolomide. Well, we found we could image cells that undergo apoptosis after treatment with temozolomide. Apoptosis is very easy to image when you have the dual color cells because we can look at the nuclear morphology, we can look at the nuclear cytoplasmic dynamics, and here we see very distinct apoptotic cells that occurred after we treated the animals with temozolomide that did not occur if we didn't treat them. Here are cancer cells in the brain undergoing mitosis. We're viewing this in real time in the live mouse through the craniotomy uh, window. We're watching cancer cells dividing in the brain. This is the first time anybody's ever shown this. Here we're looking at cancer cells undergoing apoptosis, in this case in real time in the brain after the brain was treated with temozolomide. We can see the nuclear fragmentation, and that was possible because we've labeled the nuclei with GFP, and we've labeled the cytoplasm with RFP. 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman, for this great presentation surrounding fluorescence and vivo imaging. You're so, very welcome, Mike. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you very much. Some great information and some beautiful images as well. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you as well to all of our audience members who have been participating by submitting some great questions for our Q&A period, which we'll be getting to shortly. In the meantime, I'd like to pass control to Dr. Tony Sanchez for a brief discussion of UVP's in vivo imaging solution, the iBox Explorer 2 imaging microscope. Dr. Sanchez? Thank you, Mike. Through a collaboration with Dr. Hoffman and his international team of researchers, UVP has developed the iBox Explorer 2 imaging microscope, an upright optical fluorescence microscope with a high numeric aperture designed to capture high resolution in vivo animal fluorescence images. Three key technical aspects make the Explorer an ideal instrument for preclinical fluorescence imaging. First, an array of motorized adjustable optics and objectives allows for variable fields of view from 9 by 9 centimeters at the lowest magnification up to 900 by 900 microns at the highest magnification. In addition, a powerful xenon arc lamp and interchangeable filter sets capture emission light from the visible to near infrared spectra. Finally, a large working distance, roughly 4 centimeters, which is the distance measured from the stage to the objective, allows for placement of whole mice, rats, and other small animals. Taken together, these instrument specifications allow for visualization of cancer cells with exquisite detail within their native environment. Thus, the explorer can enable a researcher to study activity with the tumor microenvironment, tumor host interaction, metastasis, and trafficking within the vasculature and lymphatics. The variable objects also allow for whole animal imaging for studies monitoring anti-cancer activity, as well as biodistribution studies. To highlight the capabilities of the instrument, an experiment was conducted in which dual-colored tumor cells were injected distal to the imaging region of interest. Tumor cells were injected into the epigastrica cranialis vein of a nude mouse, and migration was observed at three magnifications. At the lowest magnification, which you see here, one can see a cluster of GFP RFP expressing cells trafficking within the vasculature of a large vein. At higher magnification, a large number of cells are congregating within a vein. And at the highest magnification, two individual cells can be seen migrating within a narrow diameter manual. In addition to cellular imaging, the variable optics allow for visualization of an entire animal. In a separate experiment, a nude mouse was implanted in the right flank with a CEA-expressing pancreatic tumor cell line and imaged four weeks later. An ear for a dye was conjugated to a human anti-CEA antibody and ejected through the tail vein. Sequential images were captured over the course of a 24-hour period to monitor specificity of binding, nonspecific biodistribution, and routes of clearance. At time zero, no fluorescence can be detected within the specimen. However, over the course of a 24-hour experiment, dye antibody conjugate can be seen accumulating within the tumor, which is located in the lower left-hand corner of each panel. Within the lower left-hand graph, tumor intensity achieved a peak at roughly 20 hours. In addition, the conjugate is detected within the liver, as can be seen in the lower image rightmost red arrow. The lower right-hand graph shows the intensity curve plateauing at 12 to 20 hours. Finally, note the threefold increase in intensity within the tumor itself, itself relative to the liver intensity, suggesting a preferential localization of dye antibody conjugate within the tumor lesion. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sanchez. We appreciate your, uh, your input. Now that we've finished with our presentations, let's move on to questions and answers. We already have some great questions coming in from our audience, but please feel free to continue submitting any questions you may have. We'll do our best to answer as many as possible, but if we aren't able to answer your question, we'll be sure to contact you directly soon after the webinar is complete. With that, our first audience question for Dr. Hoffman is, what is the difference between this methodology shown here and bioluminescence, and what are the benefits of this methodology? Well, I'd like to use an analogy. The uh, What's called bioluminescence now is actually... Uh, luciferase imaging and this is based on what the firefly does. It, the light comes from metabolic energy and it comes directly and doesn't need excitation light. The fluorescence technology I'd like to say is jellyfish technology because the first fluorescent proteins were 
found in jellyfish which uh, fluoresce in, in, in the sea. The fluorescence uh, requires excitation light. So this is one difference. However, the fluorescence is much stronger than the, than the luciferase-based lighting and allows imaging in vivo. The luciferase-based imaging uh, does not allow an image to be formed, but machines have to be used that count photons and then create a pseudo-image. In addition, a substrate has to be injected into the animal luciferin in order for the luciferase uh, to emit light. So each uh, method has advantages. The luciferase method uh, does not require an excitation light. The fluorescence technology requires excitation light, which has to get into the animal. But once the fluorescent proteins are excited, they give a very strong signal that can be imaged readily and in real time, even when animals are not put under anesthesia. So there are advantages to both types of imaging. But in order to get real images, and especially to get images of single cells, one needs to use fluorescent proteins. This cannot be done with luciferase-based imaging, which can only produce pseudo-images in vivo. So it sounds like one of the real benefits here is that the, the real-time aspect of imaging using yes. the fluorescence-based... Uh, yes, real-time imaging and cellular imaging. These are the key, hmm. key advantages. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Let's move on to our next question. How do you visualize cells at different depths, and how deep a visualization can you expect to realize using this methodology? This depends on how bright the cells are, how many cells you have, and this will determine how deep you can, you can image non-invasively. If you don't have too many cells and the cells are very deep, it's very simple to make a skin flap window, which allows you to see single cells on almost any organ, or you can, you can insert a, uh, a small window made out of translucent material that can be permanently uh, implanted in the mouse. Would that be useful perhaps for brain imaging? It would. That, that's one way. We, we've done it with a craniotomy window. We made a small hole which was covered with a skin flap when we were not imaging and easily open when we were imaging. But one can insert a, a device, a translucent window, in order to uh, make images without any sort of other manipulation. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Welcome. Our next question is, outside of the realm of cancer, what other applications apply to this methodology we've been discussing? Fluorescent proteins can be linked to any gene. They can be inserted in any cell. Transgenic animals can be made to uh, express fluorescent proteins in the cells of choice. So essentially, any type of cell in, in the body can be imaged with fluorescent proteins. Um, one aspect that we've worked on uh, is imaging the trafficking of uh, T cells into the lung during an asthmatic attack in a mouse. And we could see the individual cells trafficking into the lung. Other exciting applications are labeling stem cells. Uh, we've done this by labeling stem cells in the hair follicle that we've found by imaging to be multipotent a big surprise for us that we would not have discovered without the use of GFP. Wow, very interesting. Well, thank you, Dr. Hoffman, and thank You're you again. Welcome, Mike. Thank you again to our audience for participating as well. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but again, for any questions we weren't able to answer now, rest assured we will contact you shortly on an individual basis to answer both your initial and any other follow-up questions you may have. Alternately, you can contact us directly at the phone numbers or email addresses shown on your screen. Thank you again to both of our presenters, Dr. Robert Hoffman and Dr. Tony Sanchez. And thank you to everyone in our audience for your time and participation. 
You'll be receiving an email shortly telling you how to access today's event online so you can see any material you may have missed or would simply like to review again. On behalf of our presenters, Dr. Robert Hoffman and Dr. Tony Sanchez, as well as the entire teams at UVP and Anti-Cancer, my name is Mike Caps, and I wish you a great day. Thank you.